Hi, I'm Elisa Fiorello, and you're watching Say What? Love is all you need. Say what again? Say what again? I dare you. I double dare you. Say what one more goddamn time. <laughs> What he's saying. Warm welcome, everyone, to this episode that features Elisa Fiorello. We all like fairy tales, and Hollywood has uh, enchanted us over the years with movies that describes journeys to realization and happiness. And Elisa's life and career is a living proof that reality sometimes actually surpasses fiction. Success and setbacks alternates in a very rich life, and you will get many examples of that. She wins national uh, talent competitions as a youngster. She gets record contracts and she meets Prince and also succeeds on Broadway. But like all fairy tales and movies, there are also a bit darkness and struggles in the scripts. And uh, she was sometimes bullied as a child. She also suffered from illness and had also lost her husband. When we meet her now, she is, as she herself described it, in a place of happiness. And you will notice why. Welcome, oh. welcome. Nah, thank you, thank you. <laughs> you're, you're having some some healthy drink, I can see. <laughs> I do. I have my Starbucks. It gives me a little liquid courage in the mornings. Wow. I, I have a beer because it's night in Sweden now. Ah, see? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I have ordinary water, so I guess I'm, I'm the boring one in this. <laughs> well, we, we're very glad to have you on board, uh, Alicia. So, oh, thank you. I love and, uh, it. I'm glad to be here. Cheers. <laughs> do, you see that, do you see that you're on my wall back here? I see all my little faces. Are you throwing darts at that, or we? Uh... No, I'm kissing them. <laughs> You're kissing them. <laughs> I have your vinyls, you know. I I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. I mean, forgive me for dreaming and some songs on this first oh, album. Wow. I guess the first it's I sing to them. I walk around here. And I still love all of them. So I'm, I'm a bit I'm a bit jealous because there's no picture of me, Tim. Yeah. Are you on the screen or not? <laughs> The circus came to town, and she didn't mind the rage just passing. You have so by. many talents, and in addition to singing, you also participated in musicals and and much more. But mm -hmm. if you want to start in the, I guess early eighties, uh, and if I done my research correctly here, uh, you were a young teenager, and you were selected among. I don't know, 50, 60,000 uh, applicants yeah. and uh, to participate in the star search. Yes. Uh, and uh, for, the, for the viewers who don't know uh, what the uh, star search is, <laughs> we can say that it's like, it's like merging today's idol, uh, The Voice, yeah. and I guess all other shows into one. Um, <clears throat> so I guess that must be a starting point, some kind of breaking point. So I, if you just could take us back and describe that period, in the mid yes. early 80s and I because I guess that that changed a whole a lot of to you oh yeah it was uh, <laughs> it was interesting so before that I I had actually started professionally when I was 12 um, and I had done theater and Broadway and up until I was about 15 and then when I auditioned for Star Search I was just turning 16 when I got picked out of 40,000 people to be on the show and uh, so then I won that <laughs> And that, that, 
I turned 16 and I had a number of people approaching my mother and I with record contracts mm. saying, you know, we want to sign you and da, 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 da. Of course, so of we, course. We took the record contract to a producer of the Broadway show I had just finished, who was a, an entertainment lawyer. And her name was Ina Meinbeck. And she actually was a lawyer for the doors and, you know, like a lot of huge bands. And uh, she said, don't, don't sign with these people. They're no good. I'm going to just take your tape around and see if I can get you a record deal. Yeah. So she did. She went over to a number of labels and a lot of them said no. And then finally Chrysalis records said yes. And Ron Fair, who discovered Christina Aguilera and worked with her, he has the same birthday yeah. as me. He's the one that signed me to Christmas. It must be a sign, wasn't it? A good sign. Yeah, if we had the same birthday. I'm like, you have to sign me. Yeah. <laughs> so I got signed. I was just 16. And then they kind of didn't want to put an album out right away. They kind of wanted to work on developing my, my writing talents. And so they sent me to London and I worked with a great songwriter mm. whose name was Ian Prince, which is so crazy. Um, yeah, I know. I, I was bound to meet Prince <laughs> one day. It, it was, was like all things yeah. set up. <laughs> and so we worked and I wrote songs and we worked on an album. Working on that album, my very first album, which was Elisa Fiorillo, which is the center picture behind Tim. Yes. Up there with the sunlight <laughs> and the hair, you know, the wet hair look. Yeah, the wet hair That's the look of the, of the yes. era, of course. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I worked on this album, and then Jellybean Benitez was an artist that Chrysalis signed as a producer who had dated Madonna. At, you know, it was a big DJ in New York mm, yeah. and he was putting together his own solo album, but he wasn't a singer. So he, they had us kind of meet and Jellybean asked me to sing on a song that a, a gentleman by the name of Paul Gerbitz wrote called Who Found Who. Who Found Who, one of my yeah. Who Found Who, there it is, Jellybean. <laughs> and uh, it became a huge hit. And it was so funny because they would always say on the radio, a new song by Jellybean. And I'd be like, Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I sang it. And I would stop on the freeway and I'd be so mad. And I'd be like, that's not fair. <laughs> and then once in a blue moon, they'd say, featuring Elisa Ferrillo. And I'd be like, oh my God, my last name. Ferrillo. <laughs> 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 Ferrucci, Figurtino. A lot of different combinations there, I guess. Oh the my name. god, yeah. there's all kinds of Italian noodles. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so. up touring with him we went to japan we did the tokyo music festival we did uh we did the montreux jazz festival which is crazy wow that's a, that's a um, huge uh, yeah. event yeah. and but it was kind of funny and i know i shouldn't probably say this but it was all to tracks i was the only one singing live everybody in the band that was in jelly beans band none of them were musicians yeah they were faking it the uh. whole time so I'm sitting here going, this is the weirdest thing ever. Like, I'm the only one singing. She's a model pretending to be a saxophone player. She's a model pretending to be a singer. He's a drummer who's actually a dancer. And he's a, he's a guitar player and he's a dancer. What's going on here? You, you were so, practicing uh, real music by real musicians, even though. Yeah, and, uh, exactly. They were doing the Milli Vanilli thing. <laughs> 
forward. I put that record out. I had the jelly bean hit. Uh, nobody kind of, they knew kind of who I was, but they weren't really sure if it was jelly bean singing or me. <laughs> and then my second album on Chrysalis was when I moved, oh, I went to Paisley Park and I worked with David Z. Mm. And then David Z and I worked on a whole album before Prince even walked in. So, and it, what was it true the incident that you went just to to the, the bathroom, bathroom, I guess, and, and you yeah. went back and Prince was and sort of in the studio. He was in the control room and he was like, "Is this you?" And I said, "Yes." And he goes, "I don't believe it. Get back in there and sing." <laughs> <laughs> I said, "Okay." And I'm like, "I'll show him," you know. And I went in and I sang and. He stopped me and he said, okay, meet me in Studio C. So I was like, okay, so I followed him. And he was doing a remix of Party Man at the mm. time. And uh, he's like, I just need you to breathe. And I'm like, you just heard me sing and you want me to breathe? What? Wow. <laughs> I was like, boy, that says a lot about my voice, right? Uh, so is, it a, like, is it a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> well, it was kind of, it was actually a hard thing to do, believe it or not, because he had just done some kind of work in the studio and there was like, like sawdust kind of flying around oh. in the studio. Yeah. So here I am on the microphone going and I had to do it in time and it was, <laughs> that's what I had to do. in my mouth yeah so that was my first experience actually with him and then i think he was just testing me to see if i would do what he told me to do because <laughs> then he was like okay can you just now can you say ooh uh, baby do something I, it was yeah. pretty suggestive and i remember he used it as like a a uh, thing that he would put in stuff, you know, ah, samples. Oh, it, sample. it, it, it took those small parts and sampled them into the mix, I guess. Yes. And, uh, yes. That's <laughs> kind of amazing start just to be, yeah. is it your voice? And then uh, be asked to breed. Breed, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> What an amazing yeah. story. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you were not that uh, starstruck because uh, it was kind mm -hmm. of natural and, and you were, It wasn't that big fan and it was something mm -hmm. about that that maybe was made your uh, relationship uh, easier i guess yeah and and i kind of witnessed that when i saw when josh and hannah joined the band because mm. they had that similar they didn't treat him differently they were very young had great young energy and he mm. just is attracted to that yeah. uh, he liked he liked that nobody treated him different and so i was definitely one of those people like i i would hit him in the arm and he'd say why are you always hitting me i said i'm italian i talk with my hands what do you want you know so and, like that kind uh, of laid back attitude it yeah, was kind of something that he appreciated yeah. like so not what a lot of people were like around him but he found it you know kind of just re refreshing i guess is the word um so yeah we we became fast friends because he he just enjoyed how natural it was you know and that developed into that he contributed to your next album i am uh, on, yes. with several tracks and uh ooh, this i yes. need and a lot of very good uh, play good, a lot of good tracks So how, oh, yeah. how did how this, those tracks evolved? So he actually came to me and he had a song that I really hope and pray comes out of the vault one day. Um, it's called If You Want to Dance and kind of sounded like a Sheena Easton Sugar Walls kind of like vibe. Mm. A real up tempo dance, like pounding thing. And so high, like really high in the stratosphere high. Mm. To, to the point where I remember saying, 
it's so high. Can we bring down the key? And he goes, nope, just lift your eyebrows and you'll hit it. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. And I did learn that little trick in the studio. It's like, as soon as I lifted my eyebrows, it was, I was dead on the pitch. So, so yeah. at the end of the day, the eyebrows was up yeah, here. Right? I was like, I don't need a facelift or Botox. It's like, just do that exercise and you'll be fine. Wow. Um, so yeah, we, we started in the studio, just kind of, we sang, he sang backgrounds and I sang the lead. So it's really cool. I have a cassette of it somewhere. Mm. Um, where it's so nice to hear us singing together. And then wow. Levi kind of jumped in. He was working with us and he he pretty much put me in that Paisley. We would go upstairs to one of the offices and we'd start just jamming and writing. And Prince would come in and look at the lyrics and get get a red pen and put like an F on it if he didn't think it was good enough. Mm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he's like, go home and write some lyrics about something that's important to you. And I was like, okay. So I'd go back to my little hotel and I started writing on the way up because I had kind of experienced not the greatest childhood in school with jealousy and that kind of stuff. It was okay. Mm. It was tough, you know, because people were like, who do you think you are? You think you're going to be a star? And I'm like, mm. I just sing. It's not that big a deal. Like, really? You, so you pick had on that, that, that material to kind of develop lyrics from, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So it, I definitely had something to pull from. Mm. And uh, on the I, way up is still up, by the way. It's up right there. It is. It's right there behind <laughs> you. <laughs> write me saying that that song helped them through so much you know and so it's nice to know that your lyrics actually give people hope and you know and and perseverance so, so, you, know? so you went back to the hotel i guess and tried to write this develop. write those lyrics and i brought yeah. it back and he he put a red f next to it when i brought it back the next day and he goes just kidding and he put an a plus <laughs> so, That's that's when he joined in and we wrote on the way up together because he he put all the guitars down and taught, you know sat with Levi and they produced it. giving me songs like Playgirl, which I was like, huh, really, me, rap? Like, no. And he's like, yeah, it's cool, do it. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Love's No Fun and that one I love. That was we recorded that live. And I think Michael Bland played drums. Rosie was in there. It was just such a cool, cool thing. Without you. the play girl and i think that's that's a good example of him pushing you to, to, to out of your comfort zone and i, oh, hey, I yeah. and i can uh, uh, see he different artists that when he have done the same i, I think mm -hmm. maybe staples said something similar and i guess everyone here worked with like i can't do that yeah you can do it and most oh, of the yeah. time it went out to be something that is very very unique and good and uh, <laughs> wow 
<laughs> yeah, no, it definitely, he was a master at making you do things and that you never thought you would ever do. Um, and a perfect example of that is when he was working on Graffiti Bridge. Um, he had me go in and he had me sing all these lines for Love Machine. And mm. I had no idea what I was saying to who. No idea. I didn't know Morris was on it or was going to be on it. He just gave me a bunch of lines to say. And mm. I just sat there and I was like, oh, shit. And, you know, like all the things that I said in that song. Yeah. And then when he put Mars's voice and I was like, a menage a trois. Whoa, hold up. You know, <laughs> like, I was like very naive and like, oh, my grandma's going to get so upset with me. And surprise. he's like, yeah, surprise. <laughs> It was the fact that when he was editing the movie, uh, I was around a lot at that time. And one day he had a rehearsal and he was in editing with the editor in one of the rooms downstairs, which is so crazy. When I went on the tour and I went to that room, I went, oh, my God, I just had a flashback. I sat in this room with the editor. Wow. He told the lady, he's like, she's going to edit. And I was like, what? Where are you going? You know? And he'd say, I got to go rehearse. Just tell her what shots look good. I'm like, okay. And then as soon as he left the room, I said to the editor, just do what you do. You know, like, don't mind me. I'm just going to sit here and let you work, you know. Wow. But, but about 10 minutes into watching what she was doing, I was sitting there and she chose this one shot of him that I didn't think was flattering. And I said, wait, go back to that last shot before the one you just picked. And I said, that's the shot you need to use. I'm like, what the hell, where'd this come from, right? Wow. But it was it was crazy and, I, and and he loved what I did. So it was like, wow, I could be an editor. But, uh, you know? that, that's, that's a pattern of, of his, I guess. Uh, yeah. uh, you managed and he, he delivered and he, he gave you that responsibility and, and it's like, uh, yeah. and trust. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, wow. it was. We had, I think he trusted me a lot. And mm. that was part of the reason why I think after 20 years, he called me back. Yeah. It wasn't just to sing and that the blend would have been great, you know, with the three girls. I think he just really liked my energy and who I was and he knew he could trust me. Mm. And that that says everything to me. I mean, so how did that I happen <laughs> all of those years in between and, and until... Uh, I was in Montreux. I was in, uh, as you can see there, on and when we met in Nice. And that, oh yeah, that's right. I have that poster in the yeah, other room. You signed it for me with Shelby and live there. And uh, I, I wonder, like, it was so nice to meet you guys there. But how 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 was it there in between then? And and did he just call you and say that you're going to be singing with two other girls, or how did that whole thing happen? It happened because I believe. He had just finished recording Bria Valente's album. And I think he was looking for singers for her to appear on Jay Leno. And I think after she had done the record, you know, I got the call and I went to LA and I was, I learned all the Bria stuff and I was ready to go. And I came in and I met the band and uh, he walks in and he's, we started just kind of jamming and he said, let's play some Michael Jackson. And he's, pointed at me like you take the lead I'm like oh my god <laughs> so I was like thank god I've done bunches of weddings because I do know this song you know <laughs> thank god for and, that yeah. <laughs> yeah thank god for weddings right and uh so I sang and he kind of pulled me aside and he he's he said we're gonna do Jay Leno for Bria and so we're gonna rehearse and like a couple hours later we find out Bria didn't want to go on Jay Leno mm -hmm. she didn't want to perform live Don't know why, 
So I guess he had to go on in her place because they had already booked the the mm. spot. Mm. So then he's like, all right, you're in. And I'm like, what do you mean I'm in? And he goes, <laughs> want to be a member of the NPG? And I said, well, I said, I know I said no to you 20 years ago because he had wanted me to stop being a solo artist. And he wanted me to join his band back mm. when I was 19, 20. Mm. And, I, and, and he basically said, I want you to just get out of the business. Just go on tour and be my nurse. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. No, <laughs> no way. I, I didn't work all this time to get my record deal to say I'm giving up and taking care of you. So I, I was pretty adamant, like, no, I got my record deal. I don't need this. And I pretty much told him no. Mm. So then 20 years later, he asked me the same question and I kind of giggled and I was like, well, I know I said no 20 years ago, <laughs> but <laughs> Now I'm saying yes. And I said, the only thing that I have to say is that I have a three-year-old. And I said, I've never toured and done the music business with a little child. So I'm a little worried about leaving her. And he's like, don't even worry. We're going to have, you know, fam families can come out. We're going to have residencies where we'll be for a while. She can come and stay. Whenever we rehearse, you can bring her with you. So I was, he's like, I said, Whoa. okay, well, That's we amazing. can do all that, um, then I'm in, you know. Yeah. So that was nice to have that. My daughter has been, been a part of uh, things that oh none my of us gosh. My have ever I seen. I told my daughter, I'm like, you have absolutely no idea how lucky <laughs> you are. I said, you, you can't, when she was like three, he, when I would go to rehearsals and if I didn't bring Olivia, he'd get mad at me. Mm. He'd like seriously say, don't come to rehearsal next time without Olivia. Wow. I'm like, mm. so I'd bring my nanny with me. Mm. I'd have to fly her. She had to stay in my room with my daughter. Mm. And mm -hmm. when it was time to go to rehearsals, I'd say, okay, I guess we're going to rehearsals. Mm -hmm. So we, I'd take her to rehearsals and he had dinner for us and we all sat there. My nanny was like, Oh my God, I'm having dinner with Prince right now. This is the craziest <laughs> thing. I'm like, dress nice and don't say anything. Just sit there. You know, and she was she totally be silent. Yeah. She was, she, was, she was so contained. I was so <laughs> proud of her. And my daughter was up singing and rocking around the table. And so he got his guitar out and he played Twinkle Twinkle and she sang. And, and then Shelby was working on North Carolina. The song oh, that she was working on and he had olivia uh sing on it like so she she's the one at the end oh. that goes there's no place like home that's my daughter wow. so she had little headphones on in studio a <laughs> and he was so cute he so just you loved. know she, she, her, her destiny is to walk the path i know uh, no. uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey guys, there you go. I hope you liked it. That is my heart and that is my soul. A little North Carolina, there's no place like home. I'd like to give a special shout out to my girl, Elisa Fiorillo's daughter, Olivia, who is singing that little part, There's No Place Like Home. And a shout out to Elisa and Liv and all the members of the MPG and my musical family. I love you with all my heart and all my soul. I saw the daughter now on that link you sent from Vegas. And oh. It was kind of fun to see you sing together. She was a little yes. bit shy, but then she opened up and she oh, has yeah. a fantastic voice too. Thank you. She'll be, I'll tell her you said that. She'll Absolutely. be happy. Yeah. We, we, we had an interview <laughs> with uh, Garrett Shiro a while ago, uh, the, the son of Gary Shiro from the P Funk community, George Clinton. Okay. And he was on stage with his father as two, three, four years old, something like that to him. And, uh, wow. And uh, he, he tried to, no. That was not my. I'm not going to go into the music industry, but now he's now he's there. He was this was the destiny. <laughs> yeah, you can't help it. And, you and, can't and help Prince, it, so. Prince always said that he's like, you know, it's not like you choose it; it chooses you. you yeah. It's he's like, and that's the word I am is I am I am music. He told mm. me to say that actually when people would interview me. He's like, when people ask you what I am is about. Just tell them, I am music. That will bring us back to dawn. Don't bring me fossil fountain. Don't, don't, don't take my soap off me. 
to say Sound of Music. You started up auditioning to Sound of Music way back in time, right? And you have, oh, really? and, yes. One and of he, my favorite all-time favorite musicals. Yeah. And, and he would a- pick on me. He would pick <laughs> on me because <laughs> this is funny. Yeah. So whenever Liv Shelby and I would be doing parts, yeah. I would always enunciate everything. And <laughs> they would kid with me and say, you need to throw the word away. Don't put the T on the end or don't put the D on the end. You sound too... Mary Poppins, you're like, you need to <laughs> chill out and talk, you know. So I, there were times when he would joke about me and my musical theater in my <laughs> Broadway. <laughs> But I think that that's, that's added to this flavor of the, the mixture. It, it, I think yeah. that's, that's that's the amazing mix of you all. <laughs> yeah, it does, yeah. Well, <laughs> I was wondering a little bit about uh, the... Uh, the Montreux uh, show 2013 mm. and uh, also um, in Copenhagen in Amagobio mm. when you when you did these disco songs and you were oh, dancing around and, and it was all of the old classics. Uh, was that something he wanted to do or you guys? Or? Yes, no, he definitely did. He, he loved doing covers um, and he wanted to feature us. So I think he was trying to find things that would really you know, showcase what we did. Because uh, the blend was amazing and we worked really hard at that. Especially, I think the studio is what got all three of us to learn how to listen to one another. Because the best background singers are the ones that listen. If you want to get this thing right, you got to, you got to tell something real soon. Same with musicians. I mean, if you don't listen, you're you're not a good player. You know. That's what so. I was so amazed about. Where the guys on the horns and you come in, and then it's Shelby, it's Liv, it's you. Sometimes it's you all together, and Prince yep. is walking around there, and everybody was, when is he going to play guitar? When is it? he's not playing guitar? And he didn't play anything. Oh. He was just laughing and dancing. And oh yeah, and he, he was orchestrating it. it. He was like a conductor in yeah, that show. Yeah. And that's how the rehearsals felt because he had a say in when they were writing the parts for the horn parts, mm. he would tell them, no, I want this line. Like he, he heard stuff that they didn't know that he could hear. <laughs> and, you know, when they would play the part, he'd, he'd say, do this, maybe change that up, you know, and he had his hands in everything. And I think that's what that whole experience felt like like prince was in a candy store and he was getting to just have fun with all these people who were all so talented and he was just love loving being surrounded by all that talent okay i'm sorry people but i just have to if only for a moment to break the flow of the interview with alicia for many of us it uh, goes without saying that the uh, prince changed his style and that he improvises uh, in a way that many of us change clothes maybe, but uh, therefore I must give you an example of exactly what she's talking about here. You will see a few minutes from uh, one of his three gigs that he did in Montreal Yes Festival 2013. Uh, on this very evening, he is exactly the conductor that she's talking about here. He provides generous space for the singers and the band members. There's no long guitar solos or piano improvisations, but on the other hand, you have a 12-man strong horn section, the greatest throughout his whole career. So this is one side of Prince. However, keep in mind that already the evening after the show that you will see now, he stepped up on the same stage with a completely different set list uh, and uh, passed on a four-man rock band, uh, the Third Eye Girl. And then uh, Also keep in mind that during his last year in his life, he, he toured with only himself and a piano. So there's a big variety. So uh, the grips on the music were many, and uh, he will get one where he, as Alicia described, just at this moment, he, he wanted to be just a playful conductor and give the band members a lot of space in a very joyful way. So, yeah. Enjoy this side of Prince. Oh! 
It just it made him feel like he wasn't alone because I think for years he did a lot of stuff on his own and I think he just he just he, you know how he one minute he was had one band and then you'd start not getting the calls and then the new band would kind of come in and you know and then this band went bye bye but then he'd come back and he'd pull people when he wanted them you know and then when that Montreux thing happened it was he wanted all fresh energy and new energy and young energy so mm. all those horn players there were a lot of young ones that you know were dancing and choreographing like yeah. you know Marcus and Adrian and BK <laughs> Yeah. The other guys were like, we've never danced and played the horn before. Are you serious? We have to dance, you know? <laughs> and as soon as they raised that bar, you know, Prince was like, yep, yeah, you got to dance. So even and Roy was it well. and it, It's beautiful to see. I mean, we yeah. watch it sometimes. Those three days, I mean, even the third I girl, the last day, I mean, the whole mix of the thing that he did was, yeah. was fantastic. Yeah. How come he's taking up all these people on stage dancing? How did he feel like that? Was he ever nervous when it was too many people? Or never, was he, did never. He have fun about that he had fun he enjoyed people he enjoyed to feel that human connection and he knew that the family his family were those fans mm -hmm. and people we'd see the same people all the time and certain fans we knew in the front row <laughs> you know mm -hmm. and i became friends with a couple of the fans one who actually is lives in amsterdam her name's miranda hoffman mm -hmm. um and then bill uh and heidi vader who Crazy enough, it, she was a huge super fan of Prince, and now we're working together um, mm, wow, with, the, wow. with the whole Purple Playground thing that they invited me to be a part of, which is basically songwriting and teaching kids about Prince and about writing songs and doing music. And we've been doing it on Zoom for the last year because of COVID, uh, but it's such a magical thing. We're, it's an we're, amazing project. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And so a fan and I are friends and we have the same vision because we both love Prince and want everybody to know about Prince, not just people in Europe. You know, we want Americans to like get mm. it. You know, he's not just Purple Rain in 1999, you know. Yes, there's so much more to it. We got the funk. Where's the funk? We got the funk. The, the atmosphere of the of the after shows it's something that amazes all of the, oh, the fans great. and all of the one who listens to those kind of recordings that may appear mm -hmm. <laughs> that it's like mm -hmm. it's it's free form it's kind of improvisation it's kind of a even if there yeah. of course are some tracks that comes back and forth but could you right. take us back to some of those after shows or spontaneous all I, all I remember was <laughs> so i have a, a underactive thyroid so i take medicine so there's that so and also i'm the only one who had to wear high heels mm -hmm. because liv and shelby were tall and i oh. If I didn't wear the heels, I would look too short. Yeah. <laughs> so they could go barefoot, but mm. I had to wear heels. Mm. And Liv wanted to wear heels. I don't know what's wrong with her, but she loves heels. <laughs> <laughs> and she's already tall. Like she doesn't what's need them. What's wrong with her? <laughs> what's wrong with Liv? But I remember these after shows, we would do a whole show, perform, and he'd say, get showered. We're going to the club. Oh, are you kidding me right now? <laughs> and I would be tired. And he's like, get, get dressed, get and showered. the feet are hurting, I guess. Yeah. Oh, the feet were killing. <laughs> so two in the morning, we'd show up. Everything would be set up as quick as possible. These poor guys that had to throw together an after show. Um, I felt sorry for those sound guys. Um, we would uh, get there and I seriously, I had to have Red Bull. Like I, like I had to drink Red Bull to stay awake. Uh, and of course, when the music started happening, I would just, I, I'd try to tune out my feet so hard, like just 
don't pay attention to the feet hurting. Just sing. Just keep singing. And Shelby and Liv could go for hours and hours and hours and sing to the cows came home and never <laughs> lose their voice. But I, I have a very sensitive instrument here and it needs sleep or else I do lose my voice. <laughs> so I would be like, I'd have to really like contain myself at those after shows because if I got too crazy, then I wouldn't have a voice for the show the next day. So, wow, so you have to, have to step on that line up, I guess. Too. Oh, yeah. yeah. I remember we were in Belgium and I was like, we kept chanting, party till the sun comes up. Oh, yeah. And we're seriously, the sun was up when we went outside. We're like, all right, anybody want eggs and pancakes? Yeah, Yeah, he was fond of pancakes, I heard. Uh, And he loved having breakfast in his room. So we would all go to the room and he'd order orange juice and eggs and pancakes. And we'd sit there just eating, going, I'm so tired. (laughs) And we have a show tonight, so let's eat and get home, you know. No time to sleep, no time to sleep. No, No. he didn't think, he didn't care too much about sleeping. People have told me uh, about, uh, uh, you know, the MPG members and other people around him that he could be so and so. But I get the feeling, Elisa, that you were a really close friend to him. You were not just a musician or a singer. Yeah, and I definitely was. And and <clears throat> I don't talk about it much because I don't want to be one of the many chicks that he dated. But uh, back when I had my record deal, you know, it was about a good year after working together that he just started to call and say, hey, you want to come to Minnesota and sing on some stuff? I'm like, sure. And he'd say, well, you have to come stay at my house. And I'd be like, no, I don't. I'm not staying at your house. And he actually said, all right, I'll put you in a hotel. So I got to the place, got to the hotel. The whole hotel room was filled with perfumes and scarves and it was like all decorated out. And I was like, wow, is he like it or something? Like, I don't know. I didn't know. I was just so naive. And I was like 20, I think. I was about 20. Mm. And uh, slowly but surely it it escalated to, you know, something. And Mm. it was uh, pretty deep there for a minute, which is why he said to me, I want you to quit and just go on the road with me. And I didn't want to. And I said no. And 
And then it kind of fizzled. And then right after that, he married Monte, which was interesting. So I was kind of like the, I gave him the blessing. <laughs> Go yeah. forward, move forward, my my friend. Mm-hmm. But what's cool yeah. is, is that I never talked about that for no. 20 years. It, it is beautiful and in I, some way that you're describing. And I, yeah, yeah, and I never talked and I never sold my story and I never tried to make money off of him. And, and he knew that, you know, mm. I i met his dad his dad loved me and i loved his dad he was a funny guy and i played piano for him and you know just just yeah we had a definite connection and then what's crazy is when i came back 20 years later it was so strange to go from that to having to having not talking to him for like so many Mm. years and then suddenly he's my boss Mm. it was like (laughs) Okay, how do I do this? You know, do I ever bring it up that we ever? And I'm no. like, nah, I'm not gonna bring it up. And he didn't bring it up either. <laughs> no. So it's it just a totally like, new, like, new role for you, of course. Yeah, yeah. and it was yeah. like brother and sister. It was just totally no issues, no weirdness, wow. and it was awesome. It was perfect. It and was I think that, that that's so so beautiful, and it's it's like it yeah. connects it connects to what we talked about earlier. That I guess he could have called anyone in the whole world. Mm-hmm. I think he called you, and of course you're very talented. But yeah. also, I think uh, as you describe, he, he knew he can trust you, and uh, yeah. he needed, that's I guess, that's... some uh, close family member and trusted yeah. person. So, uh, yeah. yeah, I think that's. And, and, and honestly, when Shelby Liv and I got to know each other and got closer, it, we were like his sisters, you know. Mm. And he just had so much fun with us. I mean, we'd go to clubs at night and we go on the limo and laugh and just, there, there's so many beautiful, when we'd sing songs in the studio and then we'd get in his car and we'd drive to the Arboretum and we'd listen to it full blast and just drive around looking <laughs> at the pretty stuff and just go, this is the funniest thing I ever heard, you know, like just pumping them up and pumping ourselves up and just being in that moment. There are memories that we'll never forget. You know, he, he was he was music and he was that was all he was about and and he really just wanted to teach he wanted to find young talent which is why he was constantly on youtube just mm. going check out this person check out this person did you see her he introduced us to um oh what's that beautiful singer um and and we sang one of her songs na, 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 na. To be. Na, 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 na. Oh, I can't think of her name. Anyway, there she must, was, must be a cliffhanger to the viewers. They have to send in. Yes, them, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tell us who it is. Tell us who it is. Oh. Eight, Liana Le Havis. That's it. Oh, Liana oh, Le Havis. Oh, the British. And yeah. He played me her song Age, and he knew that I loved jazz. And he's like, check this out. Like, it was almost like, how come you didn't do a record like that, you know? Oh, he <laughs> wanted like, to check people out on YouTube, but he didn't want to be on YouTube himself, huh? Right, right, exactly. <laughs> that that was the funny thing, yes. <laughs> he was on there constantly. The, the, the La Havas <laughs> album, is it's really amazing. We, we did oh, a short beautiful. summary of the top albums from last year, and... Uh, if we looked like to 20 lists or something, she appeared on many of them. So, oh, wow. Yeah, so, so he loved she, her. She really had a breakthrough, I guess, last year, finally. So, uh, oh, yeah. yeah. And Janelle Monet was another one. We got to meet her and mm. Esperanza. We did a couple gigs with her where she just sat in at one of our after parties and mm. she was playing bass and I sang Summertime. And I was like, this is cool. This is great. <laughs> it was just all love. Yeah. It was- Ready to love me like the woman that I am. that you appreciate or that you could uh, recommend or, or some promising artist that you might wow 
they're putting the legacy forward. They are doing a good work in that direction. And it, it couldn't it doesn't have to be Prince. We got Rita, James Brown, Al Green, all the great ones who who pushing it. But the, I guess currently, I mean, I'm proud of the work that Bruno Mars is doing. I think he's mm. definitely touching on the funk and bringing, bringing some of that element of Prince back. Uh, I don't think Prince probably would have been okay with it, but <laughs> sorry, Prince. Bruno is very talented. <laughs> he, he's got, it, yeah. he can sing his butt off and he plays and he dances and I saw him in concert and I was impressed. I was very impressed. <laughs> Because it was live and it was music, you know, I, I I get so irritated when I go to see people and it's pre-recorded and I just think of how hard we worked as a band seven days a week, you know, rehearsing mm. for hours and hours mm. and being thrown songs left and right and learning all these parts and then getting to the gig and him saying, here's the set list for tonight when we go on in a half hour and there's like all these songs we went over months ago we're like oh my god what's the parts on that you know we'd have all our notes and our, <laughs> our little voice memos shelby had a, like a library <laughs> she's like pull it up let's get in the room we'll start working on it and you know like dark was one of the songs we we didn't do it often but when he pulled it we're like oh that's right what's that part you know and so it, it's that that excitement of live that you know, any artist that would try to pull it off, I have deep respect for. And I hope that more artists do it that way. I think you touched on something very profound in the way that I appreciate Prince music. Because I, uh, I, I'm, I'm not that into television series or anything else. It's like I, I worked with culture and uh, reviewing and I, I can predict most of the stories. You know how things are going to end with the movies. But once I listen to Prince music, it's like... Yeah, he said it himself a couple of times. My fans expect the unexpected. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and that's the kind of dynamic and the kind of creativity that, yeah, right. uh, of course, most in the after shows and stuff like that, but he changed the the tones and the tempo and the songs and the way you describe it, it's it's the same to you as musicians to get those kind yeah. of set lists a half an hour before the show. And even though he might, end, he might change it during the show. <laughs> so... Uh, well. Yeah, like for instance, there was one song in particular. Every time he sang it, he had a different rap going on in between, wh whatever he would say. <laughs> and I'm so glad that the Mohegan Sun captured that night that he said, <laughs> he goes, my, my woman was sleeping with another, with another woman, like, and, and, and it was another man or, or something. I forget what he did, but we were all sitting there trying not to laugh and trying to like play off whatever he was saying. And it, it, he was just so, <laughs> so in the moment and whatever happened, happened. And it made working with him just unlike any other person i could i don't think i could ever work for anybody else again singing background trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever amen
nice, Andy, don't move, just like that. Jimmy, come turn the fan on, what's up? Who gonna clap your hands tonight? Come on! Y'all like funky music? Take our time tonight. In fact, in fact, we go. <laughs> you said you like funky music. Check it out. short story regarding what you just said his about a set list and about that he changed like michael said uh, I, I i screwed up one thing once for him i guess and you know when he what was upset at some points he could do his face like mm, like that <laughs> and this was in paradiso club in amsterdam and he was pr fixing things and there was an electric problem there and i was screaming from upstairs Prince, we need some uh, funk and roll tonight. And he looked up at me and said, mm. there, was no, <laughs> there was no funk and roll that night. And then we looked at the set list afterwards, me and a friend, Andre, and it was crossed out. It was funk and roll, but I, 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 I destroyed it for myself. You ruined it. Because <laughs> he, he knew you knew what was coming and he didn't want you to know. Wow, wow. Right, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. It's typical.
with COVID, it, a lot of the entertainment in Vegas kind of has come to a halt. Mm -hmm. uh, I I didn't sing for an entire year at like a venue. Uh, my last show, which I will be giving you guys the link mm -hmm. for so people can stream it who never get to come from Perfect. Europe to see me. Uh -huh. um, and it's a show I did Valentine's Day weekend. Doing so much traveling, never, never know when you'll be around. Yes, make me rainbows, stars make the rainbows. Please make some rainbows just for me. But first. Be a person who needs people. People who need people. During COVID, I actually um, I got engaged. Wow! Oh, congratulations! I, yeah. Yes, I love beautiful. <laughs> And my fiance is an amazing bass player, an amazing singer, um, and plays guitar. And so we we've been writing songs, and we're trying to put together like an album of the songs that we've written. So we can expect so, a honeymoon album soon, then. Yeah, the honeymoon <laughs> suites. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we'll be putting something out eventually. And then my daughter, who is trying to get into a, a Las Vegas Academy, which is a musical school. Um, they There do. you go. I told you. Uh, she's, she's <laughs> heading that direction, whether I like it or not. And she sings and dances and acts and does TikToks and social media and Instagram and yeah, all that. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing to hear. We look forward to see what was developing and the, the honeymoon suite. Yeah. That's, That's a good idea. That's a good I like idea. That. Oh, no. things open up there's a couple of different new rooms in vegas that i'm gonna try to get into and probably do like a either a small trio or maybe like a five piece band um and get just maybe even do some of my original music along with some stuff you know mm. that uh, i've done before but yeah i'm i'm ready to perform i had such a blast that night on the 14th the the valentine's weekend at the vegas room uh, i can tell you elisa i have your music and i'm so happy to see your face because you every time i've seen you you're always smiling Aww. that's one thing i remember with you you're always smiling when we met in in nice and so on so whenever this uh, problem is finished i promise you one day we'll just see me on table one in the middle oh uh, yay <laughs> Okay, and I'll be like, that's Tim! <laughs> that's, that's the Scandinavia guy, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes life's not fair And sometimes you're a step away from sanity And sometimes I just that I'm finally at a place where I'm really happy. And uh, it, it means a lot when you get to a place in your life where you feel like you deserve it. Wow. And I, I, I've been through a lot of things in the last couple of years. I lost my husband. I lost my dad. I lost Prince, two very big men in my life. And mm -hmm. it was a lot, but now I'm at a place where it's, it just it's it's all making sense mm. and things are just opening up and things are just better and i couldn't have picked a better person to be engaged to to marry which i get married wow. october 10th october 10th 10 10 21 <laughs> had wow. to get my numbers in there i was mm. trying to think 31 21 now nah, i'll do 10 10 21 <laughs> yeah. but uh yeah. just marrying my best friend 
and somebody that I can create with and just be myself with. I, it's been a long time since I've been myself. And if I could give advice to anybody out there, you deserve it and you need to stay true to who you are. And get married. And get married <laughs> to the right guy. Wow, that's and you can't one. have mine because he's too oh, good. <laughs> Maybe millions of people go by. But they all disappear from you. Hi there, Matt. Hey, how are you guys? Hey, Matt. Matt. Oh, good. Hey. Hey, Kim and Michael, how are you? Can I find us well? Got the thing! Let it oh! What's up? It's the Philharmonic. Coming to you live for the next episode of Say What Podcast. Stay tuned. This is Eric Gad. I'm hanging out with Say What, and I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and our homepage for the latest news.